hope you all had a great Memorial Day weekend, and I am back to making videos. Now, originally this video was going to strictly be another one of my top 10 videos, but unfortunately in compiling a list for this top 10, I couldn't come up with 10 answers, so uh, I had to shorten it to a top 5, but something kind of fell into my lap today that kind of gave me a little bit more to talk about, and that was the Talk is Jericho podcast with special guest John Moxley, formerly Dean Ambrose of WWE. Uh, now a star in AEW, fresh off his AEW debut at the end of Double or Nothing. So, uh, obviously this was a very interesting podcast and one that I was very intrigued to listen to. And sure enough, it turned out to be more than worth my time. It was quite interesting to say the least. So, before you continue listening to me, and before you listen to what I have to say about the podcast, I highly recommend you go check it out. I'll even post a link in the description. Um, it's the latest episode of Talk is Jericho, and John Moxley, man, he, he basically said, um, and, and this podcast in a way was kind of a spiritual sequel to the Punk podcast with Cole Cabana from a few years ago, back when Punk walked out. Um, really, uh, I, I think Moxley's was a little bit more focused on one particular area of what's wrong in the WWE, not so much... Uh, all the other bullshit that was going on with Punk, but in Moxley's case, it just seemed like he was really frustrated as an artist, and creatively, he was not satisfied in WWE. And uh, when you listen to him talk, it, there is that same frustration that was there with Punk a little bit. He doesn't uh, bury a bunch of people necessarily. He doesn't uh, go quite as angry as Punk did, and doesn't swear up a storm, but... Uh, the frustration is definitely there and the stories he tells and all the examples he gives of um, just how poor the WWE creative system is. And uh, there were stories that he told that I was not shocked at all. I'm like, yeah, I, I completely imagine that all of this is true. I, I completely believe every word of what Moxley is saying here. Specifically... Um, there was one story he told about when he turned heel, Vince wanted him to come out with a pooper scooper. And Ambrose was like, I don't want to do that. That's stupid. And uh, then he has to go back to the writers, tell him, no, let's change it. Then he has to go to Vince. And then um, basically the picture he was painting is that creative is shaped to please Vince McMahon and not necessarily please the wider audience. And that explains so much of what is currently wrong with the WWE because it's the buck stops with Vince, and that's a lot of the issues right there. And, you know, I've... I brought up Lucha Underground before in the past. Um, Lucha Underground was written by former WWE guys. Former WWE writers wrote that show, and it was a very exciting show when it was around. Um, it didn't have the brand recognition of WWE, and it didn't have uh, that strong of a network. I mean... I would tell people it was on the El Rey Network, and I'm like, what the hell? And they would look at me like, what the hell is the El Rey Network? <laughs> and, um, but as far as an exciting program goes, I thought they delivered on that. It was kind of like the writers had a vision, and they were allowed to kind of cut loose and write the show that they wanted to write. And that was the end result. And uh, with Vince, it's just kind of like he's just stuck in his ways, and he just likes things the way he likes them. Uh, whether it makes any sense or not. And here's Dean Ambrose, a guy trying to get over as a heel, and they're having him do dumb, goofy shit that's not going to get any heat with anybody. Cause that's one of my biggest criticisms with WWE right now, is that the heels never do anything that bad that would warrant them getting heat. Um, it's just so, like... And most of the time they get humiliated on... Uh, I mean, Elias is probably the prime example of that. So it's like hardly anybody does anything that gets any heat. So it's like, how can you tell stories if your villains aren't allowed to get heat? It's, oh my God. And then Ambrose, as a baby face, they had him be a goofball when um, he wanted, clearly wanted to take the character in a different direction. That's, uh, that frustration about the direction of his character, uh, both heel and face, um, could really come off... Uh, you, you could really feel it while listening to the podcast. And uh, again, I believe every word he said, because it's like, you know, it didn't feel like he had an axe to grind. It didn't feel like um, he was specifically going out of his way to bury people. It didn't feel like he was sp um, trying to be an AEW company guy and just bury the WWE. It felt like, it's like, look, I was just frustrated there. And 
Um, you're not allowed to be an artist there in the WWE. You just do what you're told. And he really, what really got me was when he talked about overproduction, which that's been a criticism I've had of WWE for years, like almost two decades where it's like, yeah, they do. They overproduce everything and it shows. And this isn't just a PG era thing. It's been going on since like, I guess you would call it the, the ruthless aggression era. It's just been, um, massive problem. It's only gotten worse with time. And you know, when I watch shows like Double or Nothing and I see guys like MJF just go out there and just kill it on the mic and just win me over in one night, like, that fast, um, there, you can't tell me that they scripted him, that he just, he went off and just did what he wanted to do, and it was magic. I mean, he was one of the shining stars on that show, and he didn't even have a match. His, his match was a pre-show match, you know, uh, and he left a huge impression by the end of the show, so... Um, and then you watch WWE and it's, it's like, I'm watching a bunch of guys try to make a uh, chicken salad out of chicken shit. And that was the picture that Moxley was really painting here. And really, um, he even said it straight up the problems Vince and, uh, and he didn't seem to say it with malice. He didn't seem to even say that he dislikes Vince. It's just that, look, the creative is just bad. It's just really bad. And Vince is in his mid seventies now. And it's like, my God, man, um, you're out of touch and it's, it's time for a change. It is time for a massive change in the WWE. They need an overhaul AEW or not, whether that show was around or not, it's like, you really need a massive overhaul in WWE. And they've had some opportunities to do that. Summer Punk, uh, from 2011 is a great example. Um, um, the, uh, you know, when Shane McMahon came on board and became the GM of SmackDown, I thought maybe, okay, maybe they can use this as an opportunity to kind of change the entire look and presentation of SmackDown and actually give it its own identity away from Raw. They didn't do that. Uh, <laughs> and we've just been kind of been force fed the same mindless, you know, boring paste for year after year after year after year. And, uh, people are getting frustrated, and it shows. I saw EC3's reaction on Twitter. And it's like, okay, I wonder where <laughs> I wonder where EC3 wants to go now. And um, it's it's a sad state of affairs in WWE because I don't want WWE to be bad. I want to enjoy it. Um, I I don't want AEW to put them out of business or anything like that. I I don't because um, you know you people you you know me. I'm not necessarily a brand loyalist. I just watch whatever's good and whatever tickles my fancy and whatever. I get enjoyment out of. And right now, coming out of Double or Nothing, like AEW, that's that's my jam right now. If they keep putting on shows like that and can build and grow from there and like all more power to them. And WWE, you can pay me to watch it now. Like Raw and SmackDown every week. I'm like, no thanks. Uh, and really, um, part of it is there's no stories going on right now that interest me. And uh, there's nobody right now that I would go out of my way to watch on a Monday or a Tuesday night. Um, and that's not the fault of the wrestlers. I mean, I, I love AJ Styles. I've loved him for years. Becky Lynch, I think, has been great. But the way they're presented and the way the stories go, I just can't... I, I can't invest the level of time. I can't force myself to sit there and watch them on Monday or Tuesday nights. Or even the day after on Hulu. Like, even that, which... Uh, admittedly, the show's a lot more palatable when you watch it on Hulu because it's edit severely edited. But um, even then, it's like, nah, I, I can't. I can't. So, uh, yeah, those are my thoughts on the Talk is Jericho podcast with John Moxley. I highly recommend checking it out. Post a link in the description. If you have not listened to it, go do so because, oh, my God, it was a great listen. And I loved it. And it, it was 90 minutes long, and it flew by. Like, it was just a great, great listen. It was great to see that side of John Moxley. Especially after um, he notoriously bombed on the Stone Cold podcast. And that weird, that was awkward as hell, that whole uh, situation there. But uh, you don't get that here. You actually get a Moxley that feels motivated, excited, and uh, had a story to tell. So uh, go check out the podcast. I think it's great. So with that, let's get into our top five instead of top ten for this month, um, and this list was inspired by the recent Bret Hart versus Tom McGee match, which has uh, surfaced and aired on the WWE Network. So, with that inspiration, I thought, okay, I'm going to do a list of other lost WWE slash WCW, because there are two WCW matches on this list, uh, matches that have become lost to time that I would like to see. 
Um, as far as I know, these five matches, uh, there is no footage of these matches. As far as I know. Uh, if any of these surfaced or if they exist and I'm not aware of it, please let me know because I would love to see them. But as far as I know, there's no footage of these five matches. But um, when I found out that these five matches existed, they really captured my imagination. We're like, man, I really want to see that. And um, I'm not just be not for like a star rating purpose or, oh my God, it must be the greatest match of all time or anything like that. It's more ju just to... It's peak curiosity more than anything else. I just want to see it. Just to, you know, because when I heard that these particular matches existed, it's like, I just want to see it. Just to um, kind of scratch that itch that I've had for years, ever since I found out these matches existed. So, without further ado, let's jump right into it. So, <clears throat> at number five, we have Hulk Hogan versus Bret the Hitman Hart for the WCW World title. Uh, the, this was a match that happened on, uh, August 20th, 1999 in San Francisco. There were additional matches between the two that were also held in Reno, Nevada on, uh, uh, August 21st and Inglewood, California on August 22nd. Now, uh, one of my big dream matches as a kid, uh, especially coming out of WrestleMania 9, I really wanted Hogan versus Bret, and I thought WrestleMania 9 was going to set that up. Unfortunately, it didn't happen. There's a lot of backstage jibble jew that caused that to not happen. But uh, for whatever reason, Hogan versus Bret never happened. They did have a Nitro match years later that was really like a four-minute uh, waste of time, basically. It was just an angle to do a cheap Bret Hart heel turn, and it was like just a cheap and dirty way to do that match, and it was not satisfying at all. Um, even though it's like, all right, technically Hogan and Bret happened, we never really got it. Not in like a real, uh, real sense, like a real actual title match between, uh, you know, the biggest star of the eighties versus arguably the most technically sound wrestler of all time. Um, but it did happen at these three live events here in WCW in 1999. And I'd like to see that. I'd, I'd like to actually see like a real Hulk Hogan, Bret Hart match. Because the funny thing about it, and you kind of saw glimpses of it in the Nitro match, where Hogan worked a little bit more technical with Bret. Like, a little bit. And it made me wonder, like, you know, hopefully... Like, I hoped at the time that maybe this match that they did on Nitro will lead into... Uh, maybe it'll be like a teaser for a bigger match down the road. Never happened. But uh, the idea of a Hogan-Bret match, like, it intrigued me because I thought maybe we'd see more of the New Japan style of Hulk Hogan, because anybody who's watched his stuff in Japan, Hogan's a lot more technical. Um, I remember I watched his match with Great Muda in 1993, and he did a, an Inseguri, and I almost shit my pants. <laughs> I was like, what? And that's the benefit of being limited with your moveset, because when you do do something incredible, it's it seems like even more incredible. It's like, I didn't even know Hogan could do that. His feet left the ground? What? That's crazy. Um, and I kind of hoped that a, a match between Hogan and Brett would allow Hogan to kind of work that more technical style with Brett, and they could do something really neat together. And, um, I don't know how these matches turned out. Um, I know the San Francisco match ended in a no contest when, what was it, Sid Vicious and Rick Steiner interfered. Um, it also looks like the West Texas Rednecks got involved as well, and Goldberg got involved. So it was kind of a, I guess, like, that match kind of got a non-finish. But hopefully it was actually, like, a real match. And I would love to see footage of it, just to see um, if my suspicion was right that Hogan and Brett would ultimately have, like, more of a technical match that then, at least more technical than what we're used to seeing out of Hogan. Number four on my list is a match I've actually talked about before in a previous video. WWF World Heavyweight Champion, the Million Dollar Man, Ted DiBiase, defending the gold against Bam Bam Bigelow. This match happened in Los Angeles on February 8th, 1988 at a WWF Live event. Uh, this was it, right after DiBiase stole the title from Hogan on that episode of the main event. Uh, one of the finest angles that WWE, WWF had ever done. Um, I mean, when I did the live stream watching that episode of the main event, I, I got goosebumps watching it, just seeing Ted with the belt and using Andre as his instrument to get the belt. I mean, that was all just a really well done angle. And, um, uh, this ties into the video I did where I talked about Ted DiBiase's phantom title reign, which ultimately has been wiped from the record books. 
and Ted DiBiase is not recognized as a former WWF champion, but he did defend the title against Bam Bam Bigelow at this event. So I would like to see it for historical purposes and as like a confirmation of my belief that Ted DiBiase should be counted as a former WWF World Heavyweight Champion, WWE Champion. I think the record book should be amended. I think Ted DiBiase should be counted as a former champion. And nothing would make me happier uh, than to have that happen. And if footage of this match ever surfaced, because uh, again, as far as I know, there's no footage of this match, it would kind of, you know, feed into my uh, argument that Ted DiBiase should be counted as a former champion because there was a live event, he defended the title, and won that match. He has a successful title defense under his belt, and to me, his title reign should count as an official reign as a WWF World Heavyweight Champion. So I would like to see the match just to see Ted DiBiase as the WWF Champion because he's one of those guys that I've always felt should have been the champion. Like him and Piper are the two from the 80s. I was like, those two should have gotten the belt. And in my mind, DiBiase did get the belt, but I would love to see the match where he defended the title just, uh, just to kind of... Again, just to kind of scratch that itch that I've always had to see DiBiase as the champion. Number three, Sting versus Mean Mark Callis from Greensboro, North Carolina, September 1st, 1990, a WCW live event. Who is Mean Mark Callis, you ask? That is a very young undertaker. So, one of the big dream matches that I've had, that a lot of other wrestling fans have had, is Sting versus The Undertaker. It's it's like the mother of all dream matches, and unfortunately, it'll never happen. And even if it did happen, I don't think it would live up to expectations now. But, um, Steve Borden and Mark Calloway have worked against each other, and it happened at this live event in WCW. True, Sting wasn't the Crow gimmick yet, and Mean Mark Callis wasn't The Undertaker yet, but um, to see those two in the ring working against each other... Again, I would like to see it, and it would even be more fascinating to see like this young version of The Undertaker dealing with the uh, the surfer Sting, if you will. And it, I think it'd be a really fun match to watch. Now, again, is it going to be the greatest match in the world? Probably not. I would imagine the match would be very basic, but it would, for historical purposes, it would be really interesting to see that match, and I'd love to see it. Again, as far as I know, no footage exists of the match, which is a shame because it would be a really neat. Uh, gem to pop up on the network one day. It's like, oh, by the way, Sting vs. Undertaker actually happened. You just don't know about it. Uh, so that one would be neat to see. Number two, uh, one of the more legendary title matches in company history, I would say. Uh, Pedro Morales defending the WWF title against Bruno San Martino in Shea Stadium, September 30th, 1972. This was the showdown at Shea. And as far as I know, no footage of this event exists. Um, they had done the big Shea Stadium shows throughout the 70s, and there was the one in 1980 that famously had Bruno versus Zabisco in the steel cage match. It's the culmination of their big feud. Um, but the 72 show had a main event that intrigued me. This one. Um, Pedro Morales, who's a big babyface champion. Bruno San Martino, arguably the biggest babyface champion that the territory ever had pre-Hogan. Um... Actually, I'd say that's definitely the case. And they went out there and had a match that went to a 75-minute draw. Now, is the match the most exciting thing in the world? I would imagine probably not. Maybe it's a little boring. Maybe it's not. Uh, it's probably a match that was not made for TV. But, again, for historical purposes, I would kind of like to see the 75-minute draw. Um, just to say that I saw it. It doesn't have to be the greatest match in the world. I just want to be able to see that match because it's one of those things I'd always heard about I've heard that it actually didn't go 75 minutes it was actually closer to 65 but they listed it as 75 so it'd be fun to kind of like pick the match apart and see it and also see like a uh, young Pedro and um, uh, Bruno going at it because you know face versus face matches were extremely rare back then so that would also be a fascinating thing to see and the Shea Stadium shows have always been like a point of interest for me because they kind of represent like a completely different era in wrestling that predates my birth and um, uh, any footage I could get from those events would be very interesting because all I've ever seen is the stuff from the 1980 Shea Stadium event with Hogan Andre in the main event but um, I, I would love to see this match. I would love to see footage of it. Even if it were just clips, um, I'd love to see uh, something from this match. Um, to me, it's like, uh, I don't know, 
do you want to call it the holy grail of like WWF or WWE title matches that we've never seen? I mean, it's it's got to be up there. I mean, it's really long match, two big stars, um, rare va- face versus face match from a completely different era. To me, it would be a, like a really interesting viewing experience, to say the least. And my number one lost match in WWE history, um, you know what I'm going to say because I said it in the Tom McGee Bret Hart video, but my ultimate match that I want to see building off of Bruno San Martino is actually a tag team match that he had in Baltimore, Maryland, August 29th, 1987. It was Hulk Hogan and Bruno San Martino teaming against the One Man Gang and King Kong Bundy, a match that not only served as Bruno's final match in the WWF, which would be even more reason to go check it out, um, that makes me want to see it, but you got Bruno San Martino teaming up with the big star of that era, the rock and wrestling era, Hulk Hogan, somewhat fresh off of his big WrestleMania 3 win over Andre the Giant. And so Hogan was like the biggest he'd ever been at, at that point, and Bruno was kind of like, the big star of the previous era. So to see them teaming against each other in the same ring, in the same match, again, would have made a really interesting viewing experience. And again, the match, I'm sure it was just a basic Hogan versus the super heavyweight style tag match. I'm I'm sure there wasn't much more to it beyond that. But um, just to see Hogan and Bruno in the ring together would be really fascinating. And um, it's one, ever since I found out the match existed, I've always wanted to see footage of it. But again, as far as I know, no footage exists, which is really sad. But, uh, yeah, those are my personal, like, hidden gem lost matches in wrestling history and the ones that I would like to see. What are some of yours? What are some of the matches that you've heard about throughout the years that you would have liked to have seen? Uh, you know, list them down below in the comments section. But that is all I have for you now. Thanks again, everybody, for listening. Be sure to like, subscribe, post the comments. And stay tuned for more videos because I'm going to have more lined up for you. But that's all I have for you right now. Once again, go check out Talk is Jericho with John Moxley. It's great. And y'all enjoy the rest of your week. I'll have more for you later. So goodbye.